Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Leah Capitelli. Leah is an author, a blogger, artist, psychic, and more importantly, an extraterrestrial contactee. Uh, how did it all start for Leah? In the late hours of the night, when my family slept in their beds, unaware of the world around them, I found myself waking up to a strange light seeping through the window. My five-year-old mind couldn't understand why there was light during the day, nor could I understand why the shimmering light seemed to be calling me without saying my name. My only understanding was I had to go to it. Uh, so without any further ado, we'll have all of Leah Capitelli's website information, contact information on our website and our dedicated YouTube channel. So welcome to the show, Leah Capitelli. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> the pleasure is all ours. And thank you for coming on such short notice, Leah. No you know, you, you come highly recommended. Oh, we, we always want to bring people on our show to talk about ET experiences from the local grassroots perspective. You know, people on the ground, the boots on the ground that have experienced these things. Uh, mm. Can you tell us how it began for you? You know, I, I read a bit uh, in your bio about mm. you know, as a five-year-old. Was that your first consciously remembered experience? My first physical experience, yes, um, and I would say, yeah, that was probably my very first um, experiences and really introduced me to um, ETs and, you know, life outside, and it was just, yeah, that, that was probably my very first experience, and ever since then, I've had um, ongoing experiences as well. However, my physical experiences uh, stopped at around six years old, and I only had the two that I can actually consciously remember. But um, yeah, I've, it was, it was a very, very interesting early beginnings because at that time I had no concept of ETs or anything like that, or, you know, UFO, nothing, nothing. It was just, I was an open book, really very, very young, very naive, um, very innocent as well. And then it just sort of, you know, built up over the years, me realizing and talking to other people and other kids, particularly, have they had anything similar happen to them? No one did. And then it kind of dawned on me, oh, wow, okay, so this is something different, that this is something unique. And it was, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty big game changer for me since then. And um, yeah, now I'm basically out trying to talk to as many people who care to listen um that this is a reality this is this is this is what's happened to me this is what i've experienced and you know if people can take it or leave it it's up to them that's it <laughs> now tell us a bit about what you remember from that first experience when you were five years old well the first um basically was very much so what you described before but uh what you mentioned before but when i uh I used to be a very, very heavy sleeper when I was a kid and something like nothing would wake me up. And then this particular night, um, it just, just, I woke up fully awake. Um, you know, just, it was still dark. It was still night out. You know, it was all, it was, I knew it was nighttime, but there was a light coming from outside the window and it was like a bluey white kind of hue to it. And it was very, very bright and it didn't hurt to look at it. And it, it was like something like, oh, it wasn't the sun. It wasn't the daytime. It was none of that. And then I just had some sort of, um, it's like something, I, I can't really describe it to the say, like nothing called to me, but I knew instinctively as if, as if intuitively I had to go to it. So that's what I did. I get out of bed and I go around the bed and walk directly to, to the light. Now I think back to that time and what astounds me kind of really makes me <laughs> really go wow was um i didn't stop at any point to actually like because there was a wall there there was a window there like i didn't i didn't stop at any point to stop myself from hitting into it i just kept mm -hmm. walking and i and that's exactly what happened i just continued walking to it and seemingly through it and i go i follow along this path this blue white path outside and there's a woman standing um, on the opposite end and she was a little bit taller than me um, but I knew she was an adult woman and um, I remember she was wearing a red dress like a red robe over her skin and she had like a very like a yellowy golden kind of skin tone no hair completely bald 
um, and big, big green eyes, mm. like huge, like, like, um, kind of like lime, lime green eyes. And they were just, it was just, it was just a, like a beautiful, gorgeous, gorgeous, um, appearance. And, um, she's beckoning me to hurry up and I <laughs> go, go towards her. And, um, she puts her hand on my arm or my shoulder and, um, she's pointing inside and I can see like it, there's this room behind her and, um, I'm looking into this room and it looks like a classroom and there's, uh, human children and there are ET children as well. But to me, they, as I said, no idea what ET or human really was the difference. I just saw there was like all these different, um, sizes and shapes of all these kids at different skin tones, you know, different heights, different, you know, physiques, all of it. And, um, you know, there were human kids, but there were also adults there as well, but they were all ET. I didn't see any, any human adults, uh, yeah, human adults. And, um, she's, and I could see they're all playing, they're all talking to each other and, what this woman said was, I want you to go to that woman sitting down on the table over there. And I turn around and I see this woman who, uh, she looked, she had the same height as a human and she had purple skin and, um, she had purple hair and she was wearing a very colorful, very, very colorful, bright, bright clothes. And I remember walking over to her, to her and she looked very, very human Like she had the hair, she, you know, she had eyebrows, she had all like, so it's just the only difference was she had a bit more slanted, slanted, like a little bit more elongated ears. And, um, yeah, it was just, it, and I remember coming to her, sitting next to her and I remember how she smelled, like she smelled like flowers, like the mm. more the more I think back on that memory, the more bits and pieces come to me. I'm like, oh my God, I remember this bit. I remember that bit. And um, I could feel warmth radiating from her body. And I didn't even have to touch her. I, I knew like she was very warm, you know, very um, brimming, brimming with energy. And she's, and she's like, okay, I, I'm going to give you some toys to play with and I want you to play with them. And I want you to play with them as quickly as you possibly can. And after that, you can go and play with the other kids. And I said, okay. Um, I, I, I don't really know what I said. I was like, I, I, I agreed to it. And um, she starts bringing out this one toy and it, it, it looked like a, um, not sure the name of the shape of it, but it was like a pyramid, but it was like, uh, like a, um, it was even on all ends. So no matter which way you flipped it over, it was still a perfect kind mm. of triangle. Uh, tri trapezium, I think. Trapezoid. It Trapezoid. That's it. Yes. So, and um, what this particular toy did, um, you could actually pull it apart into smaller trapezoids and you could just keep pulling apart, pulling it apart until they got to really tiny ones. And then you'd have to build it back up together. And then, you know, I was playing with that one for a bit. She took it away and then she brought out another toy and she, it was like this sort of like clay, like substance gooey kind of like you had to shake it. You had to like mold it with your hands. It was best, best way I can describe it was like Play-Doh. And I'm um, just playing around with it and making different shapes and different, you know, little details on it. And she took that one away and then she brought out another one and so on and so forth. I can't remember what the others were that those are the only two that I can really recall. But it wasn't until many years later um, when I was in my teen years, when I actually asked that same woman who that purple lady, Antaji-san, she introduced herself to me as Antaji-san. I should have mentioned that before. Sorry. And, um, she was saying um, that all of those different types of toys represented different aspects um, of one's mind, one's intelligence. So it was what the, the tra tra trapezoid toy uh, was um, uh, representative of logic. Mm. The, the Play-Doh like toy was representative of creativity and imagination and so on and so forth. So all of them had different kind of sort of like angles and what she was doing was that she was analyzing where my brain functioned best, like where, where I was the most dominant in and creativity was one of, <laughs> one of my strong points. So, you know, uh, with the logic one, I'm still kind of, you know, fresh too, but, <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it, she was just analyzing all these different pieces and, um, yeah, she concluded that, yeah, I'm, I'm more adapt to this particular, to, to creativity. And since then she's been giving me information relevant to that particular 
you know, uh, subject or whatever it is. So like, you know, um, talking about history, talking about culture, talking about, you know, a variety of different things. So, yeah. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I can, I can go on for, for ages. Oh, about it, this. <laughs> well, right. And I can vouch for Leah's cre- creativity because <laughs> she is an outstanding artist. I, I commissioned her to, to do a couple of full color drawings for, for me. And she did, she did a bang up job. Thank you, Leah. It's <laughs> Thank, you. Notice too. Thank you. So, you know, also the, on Leah's website, it, one thing I've noticed about uh, many people like ourselves that have contacts, the common media depiction of people like us is that we're adults is that we're fantasy prone individuals and that we make things up. But actually the truth is quite different. Mm-hmm. So many of us are very creative and, and art is one of the things that you've become very good at. Uh, how old were you when you found out, was it around the time or shortly after you had this experience you just described? Um, I could draw. I remember like I could draw ever since I was two years old. I remember my you know, grandmother teaching me how to hold a pen. And ever since then, I just, she just, she never taught me how to draw. I just, you know, learn how she just taught me how to hold a pen and that was it. But um ever since I was very, very young, ever, ever, ever since I touched pen to paper, I could do it. I, I don't know where that came from. I just, I guess that I, I always had it in me. Um, I, like I, it wasn't, it was just something, it was just, it was just an ability or skill that I discovered fortunately very, very early in my life. And I just, you know, I tried to home in on it and develop it a bit more. And, um, and I had, I had support from my family here on earth and my friends and family upstairs. So (laughs) yeah, it was, it was just, it was, it was, um, it was a really good, um, yeah, it it was, it was very good for me. (laughs) And I had that support. And without that, I, yeah, I don't think I would be the person I am today. Certainly not. And um, yeah, and I, and I home in a lot of like, I remember actually drawing these beings as well at a very early age, but I wasn't, again, I just didn't, I, I, I only, because I only ever drew what I saw or what I heard or I, whatever I felt, you know, it was just something that I, I had to pick up from somewhere else because there's, there was, I, I just didn't have the ability to conjure something like that up. And yeah, you didn't have a, say, a, a, a conceptual framework. You didn't ex- have. Just, exactly. You exactly. Yeah. E- exactly. And I, I remember even my school teacher saying, Oh, wow, those are really nice. You know, like the commenting on my drawings are like, Oh wow, these are really, that's really creative, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Oh, thank you. But you know, I, at being so young, I, I, I just took it as a compliment on my skill, not my actual ability to conjure something like that up. (laughs) Did you ever have, uh, like a lot of us have very vivid dreams, um, ET UFO related dreams or waking visions, you know, sometimes the two run parallel because Mm -hmm. we go through phases. I know for me, I'm one of those guys that it it happens to me psychically. I can go for periods without any kind of experience, uh, dream, telepathic, physical or whatnot. And then suddenly, you know, they start happening again. Uh, for me, a lot of my experiences were in, in the dreamscape, the astral dreamscape or, mm-hmm. or mystical visions. Did, did you ever have a lot of, you know, those types of dreams where you were encountering beings or intelligences or angelic figures? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even at that age. Like, I mean, nearly, nearly all of my experiences with ETs is through these astral means it's um you know i actually visit them they actually visit me uh physical contact as i said doesn't happen um nowhere near as often at all um and i i i feel like that's usually their go-to because it there they it does they physically manifesting to us does pose a danger to them so if if somebody they want to contact is sensitive to those energies and sensitive to that um to their presence, well, it, it just makes common sense to, to be able to manifest to them in that, in that, you know, state. So, um, yeah, no, I, I remember even, even being a, a child, I could actually contact them and them contact me. And I remember interacting with ET, like, you know, ET children while in an astral state as well. And they knew me and I knew them and, you know, I, but again, I had no framework for this. I thought it was, this is just, this is what you experience when you go to sleep. You know, this is just, this is completely normal. But, um, you know, and I even made friends (laughs) for a while. And, um, 
yeah, but that was that was a uh, that was very interesting, and it wasn't until, as I said, like as I got older, when I um, was taught, like, hey, hang on a minute, this is this is what that really was. That wasn't you know this. There's a difference between you know waking state and astral state, and you know what you were experiencing then was astral, and so on and so forth. And you know it really opened my eyes to a whole different perspective on the universe. That there's so much more that that is going on in that in the then just the corporeal what we perceive to be the corporeal realm or plane um and 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 not just not just that there's an astral plane as well but that there are beings interacting with it and interacting with the astral plane and beings from the astral plane interacting here with us so it's a duality and it just and it's just like oh wow it really <laughs> it really blow it really blows everything we only experience a small portion of it but it's just it's it's just ah oh, wow I, I can go on forever about it <laughs> yeah and what's interesting too leah is i don't know what it was like in your case but but when i was younger people were you know kids were more open to that because the, the conditional societal brainwashing really hadn't set in yet. So we can talk about these things. And so kind of like yourself and probably other people, I began asking my, my young friends if they'd ever had experiences like this, if they ever mm -hmm. seen the kind of things that I'd experienced. And mm -hmm. although just about everyone said, no, that didn't happen to me. I'm kind of glad it didn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't met with a wall of disbelief or ridicule. That that only came later, right? <laughs> they were still kind of in that golden age too, because we were like year two, year three, and mm. you know, we you know before the you know the walls come down and stuff, we can still mm. talk about these things. Sure. Now I've gone through the the star school scenario too, and it, it's very interesting because that can you know carry on clear into adulthood, and sometimes one finds themselves being the instructors. Did you mm. ever find yourself teaching kids and? human kids or, or ET kids or? Um, not, not personally. No, I don't ever recall being the instructor um, when I'm in my astral state or, you know, into, I, I do, I do have many occasions have actually visited other ETs while they were in their physical, like corporeal forms, like, like what we have now. Um, and they interact with me and I interact with them. And sometimes they're not too pleased to see me wandering around their home. They're like, what are you doing here? You're a stranger, get out, you know? Um, <laughs> But um, no, I've never, I've never been in that scenario. Well, maybe, maybe I might in the, in the future. I don't know. But um, I've, well, according to my guides, I'm not exactly that mature to actually handle something like that as of yet, as of yet. And I'll be honest, <laughs> I, I tend to get carried away sometimes. Uh, look, there's nothing wrong with, with, with enthusiasm and mm. being excited about one's, one's, you know, place in the overall scheme of things. Uh, did you ever have like mystical visions or waking visions or dreams about being in an otherworldly setting or scenario? Did you ever have like a dream of being on another world, another star system? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was, I was just actually vis actually visiting um, a world two nights ago and I was interacting with the world there. And I remember being at a, um, being at a place where there were ruins of a temple of a of a very old old ancient temple and um it was partially submerged underwater and um and i remember seeing uh young um people and children jumping in to that into that crystal clear water and you know jumping around and playing in the water and i remember there was like you know reeds and grass and trees growing along the uh, um, uh, uh, around the rim and i just it was just such a beautiful pristine um such a light uh scene and i remember just you know like getting emotional and not not like not in a sad partially sad yes because i couldn't physically be there with them to enjoy what they were experiencing but i got snippets of it and i um so it's kind of to, to be perfectly honest with you it's kind of bittersweet you know i can actually travel i'm i'm still not you know i don't still i still don't have full control over it but um sometimes it is very bittersweet because like oh you know you get to see all these different places go to go anywhere you want you know you can you, you can interact with whomever you desire you know that can obviously perceive you but sometimes those places where you really want to be you 
you don't you you can't experience it with your physical body and it, it kind of go back and you're like oh my physical body is lying in my bed right now you know so it's just but look i i, I look at it in a positive way i i i ha yeah you have to otherwise you'll just you, you know you'll start crying and you'll never stop crying basically yeah. <laughs> so yeah no it's it's um it's it's great like i feel like you know i i have this opportunity to really really look at how these other worlds and how these other beings live and interact with each other and interact with their world and interact with me as well. And it's just, and it's eye opening and it's intriguing and it's just, it, it's, it's so, this is, this is what makes life worth living. It really does. Like even when this place here on earth can get really, really, can really bear down on you sometimes that's kind of like my, my short term retreat, very, very short term retreat. And it kind of you know, revitalizes me and I'm like, yeah, all right, I can face another day on earth tomorrow. Let's do it. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> it. What happens sometimes is that these higher dimensional ETs, you know, to go to descend into our density you know, mm -hmm. of our planet, Mm. Yeah, it, it's difficult for them and, and it's dangerous too if they have to densify their ship into our atmosphere it can be shot down by the military or sure. you know, or something so they have to take all these necessary precautions so for those that have uh you know the contactees here on the surface that have that higher dimensional capability within their dna it's much easier and safer for them to take us where they're at yeah. instead of coming down here and having to you know deal with all these you know possible pitfalls yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier, Leah, that they taught you a variety or showed you a variety of uh, subjects. Like, did they show you anything in our Earth's past about, say, like celestially driven cataclysms or, or like Atlantis or Lemuria or things like that, which, which we've heard of? Yes. Um, well, fortunately, I, when I was, as I was getting older, when I was exiting my childhood, I started to remember my life in Atlantis. Now, I do. I only remember up until the point of my death. Mm. Um, so I can't tell you like, cause, because I wasn't alive anymore. I can't tell you the aftermath of what happened, but my contacts, they actually gave me information of the aftermath of that cataclysm of that, of the, of the sundering of, of Atlantia. And um, they were showing me, uh, it was interesting because they don't really tell me through words they show me through images and um i can process that far better than just simple like words here you go bam bam so they were showing me the uh, images of um people the survivors leaving getting out and when they finally left um the the ruin the the, the ruined land um you know they are desperately seeking out a new place to call home and a lot of other places around the world that were that uh, were uh, civilized had their own sort of civilization and culture in place but the atlanteans these ones they they wanted to have their own they wanted to be they wanted to have atlantia too you know they wanted to they wanted a, they wanted a second chance but a lot of other people were like no you 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 made your bed you got to sleep in and now this is our this is our land this is our territory you can't just come in here thinking that you can just take a well yeah, wars happened and they were showing me a lot like these wars that were um, um, going on for, for decades, you know, destroying what was left of other uh, advanced civilizations. And it just, it, it left everyone in ruin and everyone basically going back into something, you know, basically going back to the trees, you know, yeah. there's nothing left, like basically a complete de-evolution back down, you know, back to primitive, you know, sticks and bows. That's it. That's, that's all there was. And, and yeah, now it's a steady climb back up again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. They were, they, so yeah, they were showing me the aftermath. So that's, you know, and, and lots of other bits and pieces as well, but yeah. Wow. It's, it's heartbreaking because it's like how many times, does this need to happen? You know, like really how many, I don't know. And that's the problem with this collective amnesia. Now, yeah. A lot of us that have gone through these cataclysms uh, when we've had lives in these, these advanced civilizations that essentially destroyed themselves. Right. Mm. Or due to some celestially driven cataclysm, uh, you know, the surface world was pretty much rent asunder. Mm. 
the psychological trauma of that is in, embedded in our DNA. So, and this is why people don't even want to hear the subject of selectively mm -hmm. driven cataclysms because, you know, a lot of them have the trauma unresolved from those past lives. Now, when they showed you the, the images of these um, uh, major wars that happened after Atlantis uh, was destroyed, did they show like weapons of mass destruction, beam weapons, nuclear weapons, that kind of thing? They didn't show me the, the, uh, the details of the kind of weapons that were used, but they were, I, I do recall particle beams being mm. used, like something equivalent to lasers, um, and just puncturing, um, puncturing holes in the ground. And it was just, you know, like where, where once was a small village is now just a crater mm. kind of thing. So it was... Yeah, that's traumatizing. They have to see mm. something like that, yeah. Mm. And yeah, I mean, and it's, 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 it's even... Because, I mean, going back, you know, because I do remember being an Atlantean and uh, we weren't a war like people. Well, not that I, you know, I mean, from, you know, from my own memory, we weren't warlike. Well, not in the time when I was around anyway. And we, we didn't, we didn't destroy, we, we tried to keep everything as peaceful as, as possible. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, you know, the survivors just went bloody crazy wanting their own, wanting their own territory again and just started bloody, you know, shooting and destroying other, other places that they have helped nurture and grow. It's just like, are you, yeah, are you, you know, mentally that's, ill? <laughs> that's interesting because, you know, in our human history, we see similar patterns because really in ancient times, well, to us, ancient times, uh, to us, ancient, yeah. the archaeologists is ancient for us, it's like yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but if you look at like the, uh, like the wars between Sparta and Athens, Athens warred against many of its colonies. Wait a minute, we're the ones that sent you over there 100, 200 years ago, whatever. You work for us, you know, and yeah. by that time, they kind of developed their own identity. They had their own trading arrangements with other people. It's like they didn't want Athens anymore, and Athens had to go and do bully boy stuff on them. Uh, did the, the ETs, did they give you an idea of, of what their cosmology is like? It's like, like, you know, was there a consortium or, or, or a federation or a grouping of them? Did they warn about any other kind of negative ETs that may show up every once in a while and cause problems? Also, within the context of showing you the Earth's, you know, history, did they talk about these things? Um, not, not that often. Okay, so... Because this is yeah, this, this it's a great question, um, and there's as a lot of as a, a lot of answers to it because um, yeah, take your time. I, I yeah, mean, I, floor, so <laughs> okay, up, you know? okay, okay, okay. Um, so uh, according to my contact, according to Mesreth and Antaji Sun, but particularly Mesreth, he's the energy being that I um, came into contact with when I was you know in my my teen years and basically re reawoke me back into this uh world really um okay so he was telling me that after after the fall of atlantia and the wars um when the, when his people came back to have a look at what happened because apparently earth was not the only place affected around that time as well so there were other other worlds with other beings that you know physical like young young beings like you know young races like us um they were also experiencing their own strife as well and when they came back they were like oh boy this is this is bad news what are what, what are we going to do here now leave um, you alone for a little while this is what happens right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> basically. go ahead please yeah no yeah absolutely um you know you take the training wheels off and they completely crash and burn it's like what <laughs> i don't know how this happened so um yeah the, they basically were like right okay this is this is not permissible because they're going to end up destroying everything so uh what they've done was that they basically turned off our ability to recall our partially because uh we we individually ourselves sometimes it's so traumatizing as you said before we don't we don't want to remember our history our past lives but they also actually implemented that themselves they're like right we we can't do this we we've got to we've got to turn this off because this is this this they're going to end up consuming this whole world we we can't let this happen so basically they they turned turned um a few 
uh, evolutionary levels down just just so we can stop back down from stop stop from a lower base and then slowly build up again to something a little bit better because we were on our way out like we were on our way to extinction plus everything else there plus the biosphere uh, not too dissimilar to what's happening now but um, it was more there was more of an emergency back then there was more of an urgency sorry back then so they had to dial it back down a bit and then really really put the um, effort and time into guiding us in a, in a proper way now of course mistakes happen along the way um, you know there was interference with others outside as well some extra dimensional entities um, some self-serving groups um, that sort they like hey this is this is a fairly uh, 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 primitive world hey you know we can we can um, you know we can see let's see what we can get out of it you know like let's you know they they're, they're defined they won't know who we are they, they don't know because they don't know who we are or what we are we can you know we can do whatever we can do whatever we want they because they can't because they don't know what we are they're defenseless against us so boop, here we go whereas Mesoth and his people they were desperately trying to like slap them away it it's a back and forth thing and it's been going on for oh who knows how long and um yeah and the, and they're still desperately trying to get us back on track and you know for according to according to Mesoth he says this is the best alternative outcome for this world at the moment the, again i he still hasn't told me what the other alternatives could be but he thinks that you know out of all the things that could have happened in our history this is probably one of the best ones this is the best path that we could have we could have taken taken so it almost almost implying that there is um that we will get to a better future sooner rather than later so um yeah wow so uh, it's because there's so much going on like uh, because 15 you know from for me like i remember atlantia um getting destroyed 15,000 years ago and a lot can happen in 15,000 yeah. years so i am not privy to everything that happened but what's actually interesting um as well and um some of the atlanteans that weren't involved with the war, some of the, the survivors the atlantean survivors who were not involved with the wars um, I should also mention they were desperately trying to ensure that people would future civilizations would remember what happened. So what they were doing is that they put in, they pulled in all their resources, pulled in everything they possibly can to actually ensure that um, their memories will be preserved and ensure that um, their records and their mistakes, more importantly, were remembered. So, you know, going into like they you know going to different places around the world and um creating vaults um storing their pieces of not just technology but also their equivalent to crystal hard drives i mean even the crystal skulls were used to store that information that was even made before the fall the fall of atlantia as well that that was being used so they were desperately trying to do everything they can to create some sort of legacy because they knew they were dying. They knew they were on there. Like, this is, this is it. Like we can't, we can't continue anymore. Um, let's just like, even though, even though we may be dead, um, at least our memory still lives and we kind of remember, um, but we'll, we'll get there one day. And, and the thing is, what's interesting, like if you look at some of the more ancient histories, uh, sorry, ancient cultures on earth now, um, they still talk about Atlantia. Maybe not, maybe not use the word Atlantia or Atlantis or anything like that, but they talk about an ancient civilization that a, a white city or a silver city, or I, I, you know, the, all these words that, 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 that describing basically the same thing. And they're talking about, something horrible happening to the city something something tragic happening to the city something um terrible happening to the people and to the land it's rep it's repeating through our different cultures so they kind of succeeded in that way but yeah that's i think it's i think it's interesting so yeah um we just have to uncover more because i know there's more information about atlantia even even some bits and pieces left to to uncover because there's no way a civilization that big and that powerful didn't leave anything behind. There's no way. Like they, they, they did put, take precautions. They did take, um, they did put in the effort to ensure that, okay, our legacy survives. So 
Yeah. yeah, and especially the legacy in the form of people like you that would have future incarnations that would, you know, remember at least part of this. Mm -hmm. They imply that those with perhaps the Atlantean imprint in their genetic profile, morphic resonance field, that those people in particular, sometime down the track, were they to stumble upon, quote unquote, mm -hmm. some of this, you know, uh, like, like crystalline uh, technology, holding memory, holding information, did they kind of imply that that may be in the offing for certain people? Like, as in, as in, like they taking the precautions to. So it only uh, activates for certain people that have oh. a DNA profile, and that some people definitely will have access to it at some point in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, I'd be floored to to think that there's no one, there's no human on living, sorry, pardon me, no, no human living in this world today that doesn't have at least a little bit of Atlantean DNA. There's, there, I, I don't believe it. I'm sorry. Like, for example, like there's the, the, the Basque civilization that yeah. was living in, in uh, Western uh, Europe once upon a time. Some of them were the survivors, the, the originals, you know, that were Atlanteans. So they just obviously spread around and, you know, you know, made friendly with other cultures and they're like, Hey, you know, here, here's a byproduct several thousand years later. <laughs> um, so, um, I do believe that there's some of it like, it, cause it's, it's interesting. Cause I feel like, I feel that some of that technology that they have left behind would resonate with people who are attuned, um, maybe not necessarily genetically in tuned, but, in tuned on a more soul based level mm. like for me because i have such a strong memory of my uh past past life um maybe something might open up for me when like when i come across an atlantean artifact for example yes. i'm like oh my god you know this is what it is and i just have it like i just i would just i feel like i would know what to do with it even though i may not actively remember ever using that particular piece for example i just be like wow i I, I know what I need to do with this and I know, and I know how to, uh, use it. So it's just, yeah, like for sure, for sure. Absolutely. Any, uh, anything's possible really. <laughs> well, I've always felt that there had to be more than just the so-called hall of records beneath whatever paw of the Sphinx. And they've got that sewn up anyway. Right. Mm. And so like, you know, as far as the Egyptian antiquities and whoever's controlling them is concerned, I mean, the only way that, well, not the only way, but one way to find out about that is through remote viewing or something like that to find out what's beneath it, short of having ground penetrating radar, which mm. we don't have. Right? So mm. now also from, from uh, you know, you're recounting these memories of Atlantis and, and what you were told. It implies that in something that some of us have felt that there was a time when the gods, i.e. the ETs, walked amongst the humans. And I take it Atlantis was one of those uh, situations where it was just quite common to pass people on the street that weren't quite human. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, at, at Atlantia, like we, we had ETs living on Earth. They like actually took up residence and actually some of them were born on Earth and vice versa. Some humans not, you know, going, going to other worlds and, you know, living their lives, taking residence there and having, having children there as well. So it was it was no different that to, to travel, uh, you know, back then it was, no, it was no different to travel into internationally or interstellar. Like it was just, it was something that you just did like, Oh, I'm moving to Mars. Oh, okay. I'll see you next week. You know, <laughs> like, you know, it was just so, it was just so normal. Like you could, you, yeah. Like us taking a flight to Paris or something. And yeah, you know, exactly. Cultures in Paris. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was just, it was just so normal. Like, I mean, yeah, you, you go, you walk around the city here and you're like, Oh, you meet someone from, from, um, you know, Denmark or America. It, well, back then you were like, Oh, I'm from Arizona. Oh yeah, that's cool. I, I could, I can, you know, it's just like, Oh, I'm from Zan. Oh wow. Nice. You know, nice to meet you. It's just, it just all these different worlds. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like it, the thing is no one, no one considered it strange at any point. Well, not, not around my time anyway, because it, I, it was so, it was so normalized and it was so uh, accepted. It was just like, Oh, uh, you know, like I, I remember one of my, well, my managers, you could, you could say for when I was, when I was working back then, he was from another world. 
he was he was an et you know he wasn't born on earth but he came from another world and has been living on earth for who knows how long and um yeah he wasn't very nice with me but that's okay you know we all have bad bosses (laughs) exactly exactly some of yeah some of them yeah like you know some some people you can you can click really well with some people you can't and you know unfortunately he was just one of those that i couldn't really click with but um yeah again it, it didn't it didn't affect my life in any way well i in fact it enriched my life in many ways because i had the option to go to any world and experience any culture and the the sad thing about it is um is that i didn't realize the advantage at that time because because i could physically go anywhere and experience and and talk to any being coming from whichever corner of the galaxy it's like thinking about it now like oh my god i can't really do that now you know and it's just yeah it you don't know you don't know what you have until you lose it basically is my my thing and and um yeah it was just it was just a very normal way of uh, way of living and, and people as well were very different as, you know, because, because it was such a diverse uh, population, um, both internationally and interstellarly as well. Um, it was just, people were so much more friendlier. Pe- people were, um, had lighter spirits as well. Like people were more um, susceptible to kindness and more people wanted to help without actually was, was tele- telepathy more common back then yes yes as well I've, well that's actually another thing yeah you couldn't exactly you know lie to someone bullshit yeah, yourself you right through you yeah 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 exactly and um oh yeah it was it was it did, um yeah you could try but um you know good luck basically but yeah like people couldn't um yeah honesty was was if you people would always find out the truth and you know if you were honest about something and you were upfront you would have far more respect than you would to someone than someone who's like obviously being dishonest because it was going to come out anyway there's no way you can hide it and yeah like that's it, and it was looked down upon lying so you might as well tell the truth and not to mention um it, when it comes to the telepathy aspect of things when we encountered um other beings who were not Nate, who, who couldn't speak the language of of the civilization there um we would use telepathic in translators to actually help you know to translate what what they're trying to communicate and so that was also another thing like it was a basically a universal translator as well like on top of so if you if you were a proficient in telepathy and you talk to somebody else who who was sensitive to telepathy maybe not not necessarily telepathic themselves um but who couldn't speak the language you could just talk to each other through each other's mind and like know exactly where you both are where you both stand what you're trying to say to each other as well so that was so that's just another aspect of things which is like which we unfortunately don't really have nowadays but um yeah as i said it was a it was a completely different world like it wasn't it was earth but it was it might as well be another planet you know it was yeah yeah that different. definitely, <laughs> definitely. Like, that's the funny thing about it Leah, is like mm-hmm. people look around today and they see the trappings of modern civilization with people glued to their you know mm-hmm. digital phones and everything else but it's it's so far from being truly modern i mean mm-hmm. these megalithic sites have withstood earthquakes withstood everything and mm-hmm. it stood the test of time and they're still there meanwhile you know all these steel structures are rusting and you know <laughs> coming apart at the seams yeah exactly in in the uh, the atlantean times uh you mentioned a moment ago that you had a boss in you know in one particular uh period of your time there mm. uh, was there like a division of labor there amongst the people and you know what kind of did people go through an apprenticeship Did they go through uh you know schooling because in one of my egyptian lives i, I was a scribe and i spent a lot of time just being a scribe and being taught you know i, I was a scribe in atlantia oh really yeah uh, cool, <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> wow okay this is this is getting more interesting now um yeah so um that we did have we did have an education system um I, I do recall, like, we only ever, I, I only ever remember being called and referred to as the Academy. And it was kind of like a, um, 
education system where you 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 didn't you didn't just have elementary or middle school high school and tertiary it was all kind of like squashed into one it wasn't you you had levels but it, it wasn't broken up in that way um so you could stay in the cam in the academy for example um from yeah whatever young age like five years old for example and stay there until you're 25. yes i spent a lot of time in, in my egyptian in one of my egyptian lives like decades just being trained as a scribe basically mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so yeah it it's like yeah it's the um they it was interesting because um um the more i i do recall um we didn't have classes in a in a sense of like you know big group of people and one instructor it was one instructor per student and um we did a lot of our education it, not not when it comes to the more complex like the more i guess you could say equivalent to tertiary education like for example being being a scribe that required actually being a little bit more um uh, how do you describe it like being being inside being in a class and actually doing the work but all in our younger years being a child um we the the instructor and i would or the instructor and student would go outside and talk to each other you know and the instructor would say like look at that plant over there and then he would or they would describe the plant and like the functions of a plant like you know the xylem and folum the photosynthesis all of it you know and just talk about just and just just teach children in that in that manner so it really opens up the world to them not just sitting in one box and uh, you know behind a desk and just you know like just having all these words and and come you know all the all these words thrown at them and they're like i don't know what to make of it it was it was it was a back and forth sort of teaching system and it was very very flexible and as i said one teacher one student so it was you know so the teacher would get a really good impression on how the student learned and what they were um where the skills lay where the where the strengths and weaknesses were and um it was also they, their functionality was also something similar to a counselor as well mm -hmm. so if the kid was having a bad time in the rest of the school or having a bad time at home they could talk to the teacher no problem there was no like you know they they were there was like a mentor it was it was more like a mentorship if anything so and you had that uh, however long you needed it and no one no one scorned anybody for having a mentor at the age of 25 like i mean every everybody did i mean a lot of people did so i mean i i certainly did um and yeah but it was a the yeah it was a very it, it didn't feel like an education if if you know what i mean like it didn't yeah. feel like a center of of education it felt like you are going somewhere and you're going to learn about something new um, and they and they exposed you to as many different things as possible so you can get a better impression on how something worked like um yeah it, you, if you wanted to learn about mathematics we'll go to we'll go to a, a center that's dedicated to physics like it was like field trips all the time it was field trips everywhere all the time and um yeah wow uh geez it's just a very different life back then <laughs> so it was amazing <laughs> the, when the ETs were showing you uh, different things, did they ever teach you? And I've heard this from other contactees. I wanted to run it by you if, if it sounds familiar. Where they would show you like advanced physics or hyperdimensional physics, or show you all these equations, which consciously may not make any sense to you, but at some soul level, kind of maybe it's set to go off and you figure it out later on or something, you know um it's a it's a good question because i i was never uh, um my uh, my mind couldn't they they tried I, I remember in the earlier years they tried giving me some information based around math uh, ma giving me mathematical equations to to for certain things and i just never really took it very well like i'm not a math person either so I, <laughs> good. Woo! okay not the only one now uh it's good but it was um yeah they they did attempt to actually transfer information and in a my brain just couldn't accept it like it, it just came out as jobble like it, it gave me it gave me a really bad headache i could i could tell you that um but what's interesting so instead of actually giving me the hard numbers to describe certain things and uh sorry to describe physics they um were showing me um they were telling me about it in in like as if they were as if they were telling a story like 
Um, it wasn't until my later years and even even today that I'm still I'm still um, learning about physics as well. But they're talking to me and they're like, oh, so the astral realm and then you have astral line energy and you've got this is how the two interact. This is how uh, you have the corporeal uh, plane and then you've got the astral plane and this is how they interact in this universe and um, energy passes through here and there and so on back and forth they're constantly so that they're, they're, they're telling me all these things but they can't actually show me through equations because i just don't have the capacity to really absorb it so what they've done was um they just yeah they just the, the thing is i I've, i'm really trying i'm really pushing to learn and understand how how um their their um on how they understand physics and what they have uncovered and um it's not easy but um, I'm getting there, you know, <laughs> bit by bit. And um, they're talking to me about different, you know, particles and how they react with other, you know, it's just, it's just incredible. Like you have um, some, some particles that we haven't even discovered yet. And they, they already know about them. They've, they've already, they've already discovered them. And some of them, like some, some energy residue coming from other other realms pass through and fall into what we perceive to be the corporeal plane mm. and what they can be used for and how they're used and what they do and it, what their function is and it's just and and i'm learning all, all about these sort of things and it's like oh my god this is this is this is incredible like possibilities are, are endless you know and this is and they're teaching they were uh, teaching me about how they harness uh energy using those esoteric energies so this is how they they actually pull from the from um, the universe and actually uh, trans uh, transmute that energy, and they can sh switch it around into something else, like into electrons or photons or whatever it is. And then they can you can they can make light with it, they can make heat with it, they can make, do anything. And it's just yeah, really really advanced stuff. So I'm I'm still learning about it myself. So. Yeah, I, I still don't know the full thing, but <laughs> once once I do, I'll I'll definitely be writing about it if I yeah, <laughs> if I get the full perspective. <laughs> you know, because it's the, it's a hyper dimensional physics, and mm -hmm. it's what you described their ability to pull energy from other dimensions and other realms, and then transmute it and make it usable to them. But mm -hmm. it doesn't require burning anything up. It doesn't nope. require combustion or destroying anything or, or wiping out the environment to do it so yeah. that's yet another reason for the cover-up because these mm -hmm. things that they fly around and are not powered by you know petroleum or anything like that yeah the uh the, the, the ets that that you're interacting with do they give you an idea of um like a place of origin like where, where they're from if they're a higher dimensional race and whereabouts in the cosmos and a higher dimension are they from did they ever tell you something like that? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, I love, I've loved learning about their species history and their history of their worlds. Um, the ones I'm the most acquainted with, I'm, a, I'm acquainted with about uh, 12, 12 different races or, or uh, species altogether. I know there are some others outside, but I, I don't know them as well. But the ones that I do know about, like I try and learn everything I possibly can. It's just. Um, some of them um actually with the exception oh wow oh where do i even begin with <laughs> with the ones that i've learned so far um mesreth i will mesreth and his people like they call themselves they, they give okay so the names that i call, refer to these races is the names that they have told me that they refer to themselves so um i just spell it out how i perceive it how i hear it if you will and um yeah like it, it's it yeah um phonetically is close phonetic phonetic that's the one i was you can get. yeah exactly exactly because they don't obviously don't have an english spelling of it so i just i just do my best like it's this sounds about right anyway so um the nevin soros which is the name of mesreth's people one of my contacts they are beings of energy and they evolved to that point s several hundred million years ago. I, I don't know when. And they have been around for uh, at least a couple of billion years. I wouldn't be surprised if not longer. Um, so they've, they were the ones responsible for creating, seeding, if you will, uh, different worlds 
including us, including um, Earth as well. So there are other races like that, but they they are a bit of an enigma because they don't really because of their vast history and their complicated backgrounds and history and culture they he doesn't really tell me that much detail like he only tells me what he thinks i need to know or whatever he thinks i i should know and um that's that's about it and like they because they were once upon a time physical beings as well and um they apparently their home star oh, sorry yeah the home star the home world is in the Pleiades uh, star system and I've only been there once to their home world once when I was in my actual form and he took me there because I I actually tried to get Mesoth to take me to their world several times and he always said no you can't go you can't go I'm like why it doesn't make any sense and um, so one day he eventually if you will snuck me in and he was showing me um, some somewhere in there um, kind of if you some a country side area and it was a uh, I'll tell you what James it was it, I, I've been to other worlds I've seen other worlds I've seen their nature I have never seen anything like this this is literally as if like I've it, this was so alien to me I can tell you right now like <laughs> the trees they didn't ha they did have something equivalent to trees but um they weren't solid like they didn't have the trunks you could see you could see an outline or at least a um discoloration of the background of a trunk but on the inside you can you can see the uh branches you can see the roots from underneath the ground and inside that you could see they were kind of uh, like a like a light like a neon pink light through this through the center like as if there were veins growing in, inside the inside the um trunk and inside the branches and inside the roots and i'm looking at it i'm like what the hell is it you know and what was even more amazing i'm just watching this this these trees like sort of like shimmer and then vanish mm. and then they would appear again and then they would vanish again i'm like their phase I, I asked him like what is this what, are, what what's going on here that what i didn't know what they were and he's like oh they're trees and i said what are they doing and they're like oh they're just phasing in another plane at the moment i'm like like oh, okay <laughs> okay <laughs> fine <laughs> um and i remember looking up at the sky as well like i remember tilting my head back and i can see the atmosphere and i can see a what i assumed was a celestial what was it was it a sun I think it might have been the sun actually i'm not sure see that this is how distorted everything looked because it was something i've i've it was so bizarre i had no way of comprehending every, yeah, like everything you had to filter it through your own understanding and framework in a Absolutely. way that made sense to you exactly and and it was yeah because i i i'm looking at this um what i assume is the sun and the moon okay so i, I remember there was a sun and the moon and i remember light reflect uh light passing through the atmosphere and hitting hitting us the surface and on the surface but everywhere you walked now this is what you interesting oh where you walk where you ended up um the light would change color so like for example the light it uh, that's that's reflecting off the surface had like a greenish kind of hue and if you continued strolling along to a different area then the light would become a different color like a blue or or a yellow or a you know or a red and it was just it was constantly changing as if it was like it was as if it was almost as if but this is the best way i can describe it you know when the sun passes through stained glass windows of like yes, a church and you have like the, the prismatic effect prismatic yes exactly it was prismatic and it was just and i i'm like looking at this thing and i i didn't under, I, what why why is it doing this and apparently measure this like this world is so old and this world has seen and been through so much that it's the world itself is passing is phasing between planes and dimensions and giving the giving the impression that it's all like you know all these different energies are coming through and passing through and going out and it's just that's why it looks so did, prismatic and colorful did he mean to imply that that his world was in a state of transition may like maybe like 
transcending into a higher plane or something like that i that yeah that's that's yeah yes i do i that he 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 never specifically stated that but he's 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 dropped that hint several times mm. throughout our uh relationship so he's um yeah like his world is obviously very much so that his whole biosphere is very highly evolved um and it's almost as if like it's i think that might be actually come to think of it i think that's why his people are so hesitant on inviting younger species on that world because it's so unstable unstable and we'll go with unstable yeah, in a state of flux basically yes yes flux exactly i mean who knows it could be phasing through time itself i don't know yeah, I, yeah. I have no idea where where it is i don't know where it's going i don't know what it's on what it's all about but all i can tell you right now it's it's something weird is going on in that world and along with his people so that's just something that's uh, that's something for a, a later time to discover yeah. but um he, he didn't imply that you know maybe his time with you would end and someone else would come and take the place because they're, they're going to move on or you know did he uh, give any indication of that um actually interesting you mentioned that because something that's something i haven't thought about in years um he has he has implied it once and we have spoken several thousand times over the last decade right and he's mentioned he's he's sort of touched upon it once and he says um will you he, yeah, it's hard it's hard to explain but it's um this this is the impression i got from him uh he said will you be okay without me and i'm like well eventually yeah <laughs> or something or something like that and 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 um because uh, I, I think I, yeah because this is when i was really like interested and and keen to learn about his people that's when he started to ask the questions of Will you be okay without me? Um, is this, he was, he, he was, he was, he wasn't really talking to me in that sense. It was interesting because it was almost as if he was asking the universe itself. If this, if well, I know. He was if, thinking if, out loud about, was, you know, the possibility of what would it be like? Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Um, will, he, he says, will you, okay. Will you be all right? Will you be all right on your own? Will, um, will you miss us or something like that? Or will you miss me? Or it was, it was very strange. And it wasn't like, he wasn't asking me these questions. He was just kind of like, yeah, as you said, thinking out loud. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Like, where are you going? And he says, nowhere. I said, oh, then why are you talking about it? He says, don't worry about it. Well, thanks for making me worry about it. And well, then the thing yeah. about it, you know, is, and the beauty of it is Leah is what will happen eventually is, within your morphic resonance field within your dna profile your energy field he, no matter where he goes and you know continue his journey his people's journey in, in whatever higher plane of existence there'll always be that connection to you it's just like yeah. how our loved ones go into the afterlife and when they need to get a message to us they will you know yeah. and even even our beloved you know four-legged family members when, <laughs> when they pass over you know they, they let us know they're in a good place you know yeah. so uh, you know I'm getting chills thinking about it because what what happens to us in our physical embodiment we, we forget that you know we have this connection you know that spans time and space and all these different different dimensions and realms and we are emotional beings and it's easy for us to miss we we, we mm. form attachments to people mm. you know of, of all stripes you know mm. and you just describing this you know what amounts to a relationship with uh, you know, this is highly evolved being. Well, we've reached the end of the fascinating oh. first segment. We've got a whole <laughs> hour to go. Uh, Leah, please tell our listeners uh, how they can get a hold of you and what your website is. Yeah, so you can uh, reach me on my uh, Facebook. Uh, you, it's Leah Capitelli. Um, you can hit me up anytime. I will respond to you as soon as possible. Um, I'm also on Instagram as well. So yeah, come and follow me on there. Um, my website is starseedleah at, um, sorry, hang on. I'm just trying to remember the name of the website. Oh, I've got it. I can pull it up. It's, um, oh, thank you. Yeah. So it, it's starseedleah.wixsite, W-I-X-S-I-T-E. Dot com. So all together, starseedleah.wixsite.com. And uh, we will be sure to put 
the uh, the links to uh, Leah's website on our dedicated website and our YouTube channel. So we've reached the end of the uh, first half. Uh, to our dear listeners, if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to the cosmic switchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.